So it's a very, very great honor to be here with Andrew Quintman and Kelly Dorji. Uh, and the, the launch of this book, Mystics and Skeptics in Hindi, uh, it has a beautiful essay in it. One of the lead essays on Milarepa, Guru Milarepa, is by Andrew Quintman. So uh, we are here to listen to Andrew Quintman and Kelly Dorji speak of Guru Milarepa, uh, in which, and, and to talk of um, this mystic, much forgotten in India, um, saint whose crazy wisdom ideas continue to guide so many of our own mystic traditions. A Hindi uh, edition of the book is called Himalaya Ek Khoj, Lama, Sant, or Nastik. And it's translated from the original by Prabhat Ranjan. Thank you, Urmila, if she's here. And a lot of, it's not easy to translate tribit, Tibetan text. Please sit down, both of you. Yeah. Uh, into Hindi. It's very, it was difficult and artist's work, but we did it. It's an anthology which embarks on a quest through the Himalaya, speaks of encounters with wanderers and seekers, gurus and enlightened souls, tricksters and delusionists. It looks at different aspects of spiritual practice in the high reaches of the Himalaya. The Tibetan Buddhist adept Milarepa, 1052 to 1135, became the foremost disciple of Marpa, the great translator, whose guru was the Indian master Naropa. These people are forgotten, but they are not forgotten. They live on in the tradition of those who know these things. His songs of inner realization, the 100,000 songs of Milarepa, continue to inspire and illuminate. Professor Andrew Quintman, writer, translator, and scholar of Buddhist traditions, will later be in conversation with Bhutanese actor, artist, festival director, honorary consul of the United Kingdom in Bhutan, Kelly Dorji. And they will explore the living legacy. But first, the launch of the book. May I request Andrew, Kelly, Navtej, Alka Pandey, any other contributors to the book who may happen to be here, as well as Swati Chopra and Aman Arora of HarperCollins. And of course, Urmila. What happens now? We go there. Uh, it's a pleasure here uh, to be here with uh, the Hindi edition of Mystics and Skeptics, and we also have the paperback of the English edition releasing right now. So I would uh, request everybody on stage to please formally unveil uh, the copies. And uh, here is the beautiful cover. Himalaya <laughs> Ek Coach. Thank you, everyone. Now over to the session. Thank you, everyone. Now we'd like to start the conversation. Check. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 17th edition of the Samsung Jaipur Literature Festival. My name is Kelly Dorji. In conversation with the wonderful 
Andrew Quintman. Before, uh, uh, Andrew and me go a few years back. He came to Bhutan uh, many, many years ago, but we only became acquainted in uh, 18, uh, 2018 when he visited us at the Mountain Echoes edition of what is today the Bhutan Echoes. I'd like to introduce uh, Milarepa, the wonderful mountain poet saint to some of you. Most of you who are sitting here probably already have some knowledge of this great saint. But for those, who don't, for those of you who don't know too much about him, I'd like to introduce a little bit about him so that you have a good base to go on when such an uh, accomplished scholar like Andrew, who knows about Milarepa more than anybody else, talks about him, so that you can follow what he's talking about. So, am I clear? Yeah. All right, good. I'll have to read this out to you. The 11th century poet saint Jitsun Milarepa is considered one of the most revered and influential figures in Tibetan Buddhism. His life embodied transformation, perseverance, spiritual devotion, and eventually enlightenment. Milarepa's life and teachings continue to inspire practitioners offering lessons in inner strength, resilience, and the realization of true happiness. His story is a testament to the human capacity for profound spiritual growth and the, tendence, and the transcendence of worldly suffering. Early on in his life, Milarepa endured much tragedy and suffering. And after his father's death, his family wealth was snatched by a greedy uncle. And Milarepa fell into, into a thirst for revenge. However, his mother guided Milarepa to seek out Marpa, a great translator and a renowned teacher to find guidance and redemption. Now, Mystics and Skeptics in Search of Himalayan Masters, the book, uh, tells a story in chapter two, written by Andrew, on how Milarepa underwent rigorous training in Buddhist practices, including meditation and chanting recitation. Through intense hardships and repeated trials, he eventually attained great spiritual realization, becoming an enlightened master in his own light. And here it is good to note that Milarepa is considered one of the greatest Himalayan saints because through his suffering and limited teaching, at the end of a single life, he attained enlightenment, which is one of the greatest appeals to many Buddhists around the world. Now, Namita Gokhale edits this compilation of fantastic writers like Alexandra David Neal, Rajiv Marotra, Madhu Tandon, Namita Gokhale herself, Tsring Tashi, Alka Pandey, Vibha of Kaul, and many more. And through this insightful anthology of stories of gurus and enlightened souls, tricksters, tricksters and delusionists, and as the, Hindu, uh, as, as the Hindu newspaper proclaims, helps to fathom why people take a leap of faith. Or as India today writes, ambitious in both spatial and temporal sweep. Through mystics and skeptics in search of Himalayan masters, we seek to shed light on a great Himalayan guru in chapter two, Milarepa, the greatest master by Andrew Quintman. Now let's dive into finding out the contradictions and greatness surrounding this Tibetan saint, shall we? Andrew, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, Milarepa remains a presence in the living traditions of the Himalayas where his teachings emphasize the transformative powers of compassion, wisdom, and the pursuit of liberation from suffering. We know very little about the historical person, but even less about the literary person is deeply, sorry, the, the literary person is deeply uh, and richly characterized. What can you tell us about Milarepa 
the man versus Miller Epper, the literary figure? Wonderful. Thank you for that question, Kelly. Thank you for your introduction. And first, uh, thank you, uh, all the friends in the audience here. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you to Namita uh, for putting together this wonderful edited volume and for giving me the opportunity to contribute. It's really wonderful to be here speaking about Milarepa. Um, so I often uh, refer to the life of Milarepa, a famous text written in 15th century Tibet, as Tibet's most famous book. So some of you may be familiar with the title known as uh, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It became quite famous in the West. Uh, it was published, first translated and published in the late 1920s. Actually, this is a really obscure work. Hardly anybody reads it. It's almost impossible to read straight through to the end. Unlike that work, the life of Milarepa is a real story filled with living characters that resonates uh, resonated uh, with readers in the 16th century in, in medieval Tibet and continues to resonate with readers today. And so uh, to come to your question uh, about the distinction between Milarepa as a historical individual and as a literary character, what's so interesting is that we, we know almost next to nothing about Milarepa as a historical figure. We have no written records uh, from when he lived. He didn't write anything down himself. In fact, some of the earliest sources we have are contradictory about elements of his life. So we can say very little about Milarepa as the man as a historical figure, similar to the figure of Shakyamuni Buddha himself, of Gautama Buddha. But what we can say a tremendous uh, amount about is about Milarepa, the literary figure. M Milarepa, the, uh, the, the, um, the image of what a religious and spiritual practitioner should look like. And much of that comes through this 15th century or 16th century uh, telling of his life story. Uh, that's crafted in such exquisite detail uh, that resonates with elements of human pathos, of suffering, of devotion, and eventually of spiritual liberation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, in light of that, society often dictates what a religious person looks like. Yeah. What can you tell us about uh, the habits and practices or his approach, Milarepa's approach to religious practice? Yeah, fascinating question. So again, you know, what we know about Milarepa is really from a later literary retelling, recrafting of his life. And that story was intentionally presented in a certain way. And to understand what that means, we need to think a little bit about the historical context of when the story was written. So he lived in the first half of, uh, of the, first, uh, the, the first half of the year 1000. So in the early 11th century. His story was not written down in the way that we know it now until three or four hundred years later, in the 15th century. At that time, in the 15th century in Tibet, Buddhism was deeply institutionalized. It was embedded in massive monasteries with thousands, even tens of thousands of monks that were often uh, held together and led by recognized reincarnations known as tulkus. They were centers of religious and spiritual power, but also centers of economic power, of social power, of political power. And the author of Milarepa's life um, was presenting a vision of Buddhism that really countered that form of Buddhist practice. And what he was trying to do was to reorient the reader's uh, um, imagination to what Buddhism had been in the past. And so Milarepa is represented as this kind of iconoclastic, crazy wisdom figure who was, had no interest in the trappings of worldly life. He left behind ordinary society, but he also left behind the trappings of the monastic institutions. He had no interest in the finery of, uh, of religious robes or of religious offerings. Instead, he led his life wandering in mountain solitude, meditating in mountain caves in the jungles of Nepal in the high Himalayas. And so we see sort of two competing visions of what his religion looks like. On the one hand, um, it, it goes back to the roots of Buddhism, to the, solid, the idea of the solitary meditator, um, relying only on the words of his teacher, meditating in mountain caves and uh, uh, under a tree in, in the jungle. And this really captures something of the spirit of Buddhism as it had been many centuries before. Um, so 
in the one sense, this is very much kind of mainstream Buddhism. But he's also depicted as a kind of renegade, as, as someone who is, uh, who is uh, sort of competing against the prevailing norms of religion, which had really been institutionalized in the big monasteries of Tibet. Amazing, amazing. So in his break away from society and to be more communal with nature, yeah. uh, it may be noted that even though he had these thousands of followers of monks, he also taught to non-humans yeah. and used poetry as, as a means for uh, teaching. Could you tell us a little bit more about this vehicle? Yeah, wonderful. Uh Wonderful imagery there. So Milarepa, of course, was, is always presented as the preeminent uh, yogi and Buddhist master. He had many, many disciples. Some were monks, some were lay people. But he taught in such a wide and open way uh, that he could convert to Buddhism and convert to his disciples beings from a wide range of, of, uh, of social and, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and economic sort of classes, mm -hmm. um, but also uh, taught to non-human spirits. He had a deep connection with the local sort of protective and resident deities of the places uh, that he meditated. Um, and there's a very famous story, which I'm, you're probably familiar with, in which uh, Milarepa is said to have been meditating in northern Nepal when he meets a great hunter. And so this is known as the story of the huntsman and the deer. And in this story, uh, he first encounters uh, a, a, a terrified deer who's running away from, uh, from uh, his attacking uh, hunter. And the deer comes up to Milarepa, and Milarepa sings to him, teaches him the Dharma in the form of song, and calms the, the, this, this poor deer who sits by one side. And then appears uh, this uh, snarling hunting dog who tries to attack Milarepa, and again Milarepa sings to him uh, the Dharma, and the dog sits on the other side. And then finally, uh, the huntsman comes and sees that the, this yogi has stolen not only his prey, but also his precious hunting dog, and he takes a bow and an arrow, and he stands, and he says, I'm about to you know, shoot you f through the heart for stealing my deer and my dog. And of course, Milarepa sings to him as well, uh, and the huntsman gives gives up his bow and arrow, his life as a hunter, and converts uh, to become a follower of, of Milarepa. So a few things here. One is that Milarepa has this ability to teach not only humans, but also to animals, a little bit like St. Francis of, of Assisi. But his primary vehicle for teaching was not the erudite philosophical discourses of the great philosophers of the past, but using the vehicle of poetry, Milarepa is known not only as a great master, but also as a preeminent poet who is drawing on the poetic forms from India, especially Doha and Charyagiti and Vajragiti, but deeply suffused them with the uh, kind of cultural views, cultural language of early Tibet. Firstly, I hope the photographers got got Andrew standing up. <laughs> we need that photograph for the next book of him in action as Milarepa. I think that would be a nice picture to have. Well done. <laughs> um, clearly, you've, designed, uh, you've defined a, a decoding mm -hmm. to uh, Milarepa's thousands of uh, dohas or yeah. po poems that he created. Um, is there a simple decoder to his poetry, because it, he was often quite non-conventional yeah. in, in the way he taught. And the way he taught varied according to his audience, yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah. So perhaps for those who read uh, other works, uh, speaking of Milarepa's great songs and poems, uh, is there some sort of simple decoding for uh, what do you call it? Uh, Miller rapper for dummies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like me. Yeah. One of the, it's a, it's a wonderful question. Uh, so many aspects of Buddhism seem to be, you know, high in the clouds, difficult to relate to, difficult to understand, difficult for the ordinary person to understand. And what's so profound about the life of Miller Epa, and the literature that tells the story of Miller Epa's life is that it presents the path that anyone can follow. Milarepa, in his story, 
um, at, at one point, uh, one of his disciples comes and says, you are such a great, great master. Please tell us whose incarnation you are. What great Buddha or Bodhisattva are you manifesting? And Milarepa says to his disciple, well, what you've told me is a sign of your great devotion to me, but really you've misunderstood the entire message of my life, which is anyone, any one of you, any one of us can do what I've done. Even me, a great sinner, Milarepa, who had been a mass murderer in the early part of his life, had murdered dozens and dozens of family members as an act of revenge for his family. Even someone like that could follow the path, put it into practice, and eventually ta uh, attain spiritual awakening. So if there's a message, if there's a decoder in his life story, it really is that anyone can do what he's done if you put your mind to it. It takes perseverance, it takes diligence, it takes attentiveness, but it's, it's a path that's available to anyone. That's wonderful. Yeah. Just to dial it back a little bit, Andrew, um, Milarepa, although his date of birth is a bit obscure, uh, lived a very long life, and that's yeah. acknowledged, yeah. Uh, perhaps into his mid to late 80s. 80s yeah. Would you be able to tell us, in relation to his life, how much he truly suffered? Yeah. And then how much part of that life he actually spent teaching? Yeah. Wonderful question. So there are, one of the wonderful things about the life story of Milarepa is that it's filled with emotional themes. It's filled with a sense of genuine human pathos, of true emotion. The characters in his life story read like a contemporary novel. And it's really unusual for pre-modern um, or for medieval Buddhist literature. And one of the primary themes of his life is the, is the notion of suffering. And of course, we know, you know, uh, one of the themes of the Buddhist teaching more broadly is that the life that we live, our experience of the world, is characterized by suffering. It was the first truth of the Buddha, the first noble truth, the truth of suffering. And that, in a sense, is the first truth of Milarepa's life as well. He's born on the margins of Tibet, not in the center of power, but really on, on the margins of the, of the Tibetan frontier. And early in his life, uh, his experience is marked by loss. His family had been wealthy. All of that wealth was lost. Uh, when he was a young boy, his patrimony, which had been promised to him, was stolen by his greedy aunt and uncle. He was forced into a life of basically slavery and, and uh, poverty. And he was uh, cajoled by his, by his mother uh, to train in the arts of black magic in order to wreak revenge on her behalf, and in doing so, kills dozens of people in his family. He ruins his village, buries it under hell, so it's told. That's a terrible kind of weight for any human to bear, and in fact, there's a sort of pivotal moment in his story where he understands the weight of the evil deeds that he's done, and he repents it profoundly, and he goes in, in, in search of a Buddhist master. When he finds his master, of course, you know Marpa, the translator, Marpa, uh, uh, from, from Hlodrak, from the southern cliffs of Tibet. Um, he's forced to undergo a, a, a program of training which itself is also characterized by tremendous suffering. He's not simply taught, uh, you know, the, the sort of aspects of, of what the Buddha taught, uh, but is forced to undergo a series of physical trials, of labors, of constructing these immense stone towers carrying each stone on his own back, one by one, and placing them you know, higher and higher, and then tearing them down until only in the fourth tower that he builds up nine stories tall, his back is covered in sores like a pack animal, so he says. Um, all the while, his teacher is refusing to teach him Buddhism, the thing that he wants the most. And there's a moment in his story where Milarepa says, oh, I've given up everything to find a Buddhist teacher, and I've suffered so much at his feet, and yet I've gotten nothing for it. I've gotten not, not even a single teaching. I should just go and jump off a cliff and kill myself. And it's this moment of like true pathos, of true, you, you, feel, you, you feel his embodied suffering. And of course, he's saved by, uh, by his teacher's wife who brings him back, and eventually he's given the teachings and he goes on. So it, there are moments along the way where you feel the suffering 
that all sentient beings feel, but as embodied by him in his story. I think it's one of the profound messages of his story and one of the great sort of literary techniques of the author is that he draws his reader in to feel the experiences that Milarepa himself is feeling. Interestingly, the life of Milarepa, though profoundly tragic, yeah. uh, doesn't seem to be so melancholic. Yeah. And I wonder why we make that distinction, where, why we understand that the man went through so much suffering, yet we celebrate what he achieved at the end. Yeah. So why do you feel modern society reveres his life that way? Yeah, I, thank you, Kelly. I like the way you framed the question. Why does, moder why does even modern society revere this figure and celebrate his life. It is not a story that only applies to medieval Tibet or the Himalayan world. It's a story that I think applies to each and every one of us, even in the modern world, maybe even more so in the modern world, considering the, the, the troubles that we, uh, as, a, as a global community, are facing now. Yes. So his story is, is one of suffering, but it's also a story of triumph. It's the story that we can all triumph through the hardships that we face if we show determination and fortitude through those difficulties that in the end, we will come to, to, to triumph. Um, but one of the other things that I love about this story, um, its literary qualities, its poetic qualities are beautiful, but it also resonates with a real sort of earthy sense uh, of what Himalayan peoples are like. And part of that is this like, deep, resonant sense of humor. So I'll tell one, one story, if I might, from the end of his life. This is at the very end of the story. Milarepa has died. All of his disciples have gathered. And he left a note for his disciples that said that I've you know, spent my life uh, wandering the Himalayan countryside and teaching disciples. And so you should look under this stone near where I have passed away and you will find there all of the wealth that I've accumulated during my life. And of course, his disciples are all keen for some kind of relic from their master who has now departed, and they want bits of his robe or his, his hat or his walking staff. And finally, one of his disciples goes uh, to this place you know, that, that Milarepa suggests, and he opens it up, he opens the, the, the rock and reaches inside, and there's a letter and the letter by, by Milarepa says something like this. He says, I've lived my entire life according to the teachings of my Guru Marpa, who has uh, inspired me to spend years and years, most of my life, in solitary meditation, attending to the cultivation of my own mind. For any of you think that I have even a whit of interest in the things of this world, let alone gold, stuff his mouth with shit. <laughs> and of course, all of his disciples who had been very teary-eyed burst out laughing, and they realized that not only is he a very serious guy, but he also has a good sense of humor. Yes, it also reminds me of another story being doing the rounds in my research of Milarepa, that when uh, his disciples asked him for a last teaching, he quite simply stood up, lifted his dress, and showed them his buttocks, which was filled with sores uh, from having sat on a rock and meditating for perhaps too long. Excellent. Thank you for not demonstrating that, Kelly. <laughs> Are you sure? Because I'm wearing a dress. <laughs> no, this sofa is very soft. Yeah. No sores there. Can I ask you a, 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 a question? Since you, sure. since Kelly, since you asked about or you re referred to the resonance of the story of Milarepa in the contemporary world, coming from you know a Buddhist culture yourself, from a Buddhist country, uh, deeply steeped in the traditions of Milarepa, where Milarepa is really celebrated as a hero, I wonder how you've seen Milarepa alive in 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 the culture, not as a historical figure, but really as a living figure. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Milarepa for me and my countrymen and my fellow Buddhists is a very revered figure. For us, he's a, he's a real icon because the inspiration that somebody can through so much suffering still attain enlightenment in one lifetime 
is what our religion is all about. So Milarepa, having suffered so much and endured and persevered and through his resilience kept the faith, eventually became enlightened. And for us, that is like uh, a degree, yeah. <laughs> the ultimate degree. Yeah. But as mendicants uh, and Buddhists, uh, I wrote something over here, as mendicants and Buddhist Drukpa Kagyu practices, practitioners, uh, in Bhutan, aspire toward, more towards both uh, the practice as well as the theory of scholar, uh, scholarly study. And there was an incident uh, where, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, Milarepa is depicted as a green figure. And I always wondered why. And in my research, I found out that in his isolation, he survived on nettle leaves. And he ate so many nettle leaves that he turned green in color. So it just shows uh, the absolute extremes yeah. with which he would go to in, in, in so many ways. He was extremely evil. At the same time, he was extremely regretful and he became extremely um, extreme in his, in his atonement. Yeah. Uh, for the average person, Milarepa is someone who suffered so much and having been to the lowest of lows, he overcame great regret and remorse. The best thing about bad action is that it can be transformed, it can transform your character into a highly diverse, d devoted person. So you don't have to be born blessed with compassion or riches or anything, but you can attain it on your own. And I think that is our philosophy. That's Thank you so much. Ab <laughs> absolutely true. And uh, since you brought up the, the uh, common representation of Milarepa as, as turning green from having eaten so many nettle leaves, you, you know what nettles are. Those, uh, plants that sting you when, when you touch them. And the idea is that he would not even waste a moment going to beg for food down in the village, but would just eat what was growing around him, and those were nettles. And he lived for 12 years in meditation, eating nothing but nettles, so that he turned green like a nettle worm. And I, I'm working on a book now that's a history of the monastery that was built on the retreat place where it said that Milarepa turned green and I was there. This is in southern Tibet, close to the border of Nepal. And I was there uh, some years ago and there was a group of nuns, of women who were sort of keeping the tradition of Milarepa alive. And they sat me down, gave me tea. It was time for their noon meal. And what did they serve? <laughs> but porridge made from nettles growing on the, wild, on, on the mountainside. And of course, they offered me a bowl. Milarepa was very clear that he had no seasoning, there was no broth, there was no meat, there was no salt. It was just nettles. So that's what I had, a bowl of nettles, no broth, no meat, no salt. And it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but his doctor today would have said he's got excellent that's, kidneys because it's good for your kidneys. <laughs> that, that, that's right, that's right. Um, yeah. Shall we take some... I was just going to open the floor up. Uh, we have some very interested looking faces and interesting looking people. Uh, would you like to ask Andrew any questions? Or, or Kelila. <laughs> I know nothing. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to check when you're talking about Milarepa, it sounds very much like Ashoka who also was quite evil and then he kind of took up Ashoka and yes. spread uh, Buddhism, took up Buddhism and spread it all over Asia. So have you done any research on it and if you could throw some light on it? Thank you for that question. Did you all hear the question about the parallels between Miller's, uh, Milarepa's life and that of Ashoka, the great uh, Indian emperor uh, who gave up uh, his military life to adopt uh, the tradition that, that, that the Buddha taught. And that's a really great uh, observation. And in fact, um, Milarepa's life embodies uh, this idea that we find in many stories, not only in Ashoka, but also in figures like Devadatta, who was uh, the historical Buddha's nephew who tried three times to murder the Buddha out of je jealousy during his lifetime, but eventually goes on to become an arhat himself. It mirrors uh, an, uh, another famous disciple of the Buddha. His name was Angulimala, 
which means the garland of fingers. And this was a great mass murderer who was told by his own teacher at one point that he must kill 1,000 people. And as a sign that he's actually killed someone, he's, he should cut their finger and wear it as a necklace around his neck. And the last person he was to kill was his own mother. And of course, the Buddha thinks this is really terrible and intervenes and Angulimala sort of finds redemption in following the Buddha. And this is a very similar kind of story that we find in Milarepa's life. And I think they tell us the same kind of message. We're all imperfect beings. We've all done terrible things in the past. And yet we can overcome them. The, the teachings of the Buddha are powerful enough that they allow us to un overcome our own human Im imperfections. So thank you for that. Uh, yes, the lady in the middle there. Hello, uh, my oh. name is Bujung Di. Sorry. I am a Tibetan writer. Uh, so I nice just, to see you, Bujung La. <laughs> uh, you mentioned, when talking about Melirebus poetry, you mentioned about Indian influence, particularly Doha. And you also spoke about medieval Tibet. I wonder if you could speak a little more about these two issues. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Puchin La, uh, for that question. So, Milarepa is often uh, uh, recognized as one of the founders or progenitors of a particular form of Tibetan verse. And the Tibetan word for that is gore. Gore is often translated as a song of realization or a spontaneous poem, and the idea at least the idea of this kind of poetry is that it's not something which is carefully written down, but it's uttered spontaneously as a reflection of one's own mental development, of one's own experience in meditation. And that was an important tradition at the time of Milarepa, and it continues to be a living tradition. There are still uh, Buddhist masters, especially in Tibet, who are composing this form of poetry based on their own meditative experience that is called gore. That's the sort of religious story of what this poetry is like. Of course, we know that this kind of poetry, gore, is very carefully written and edited and sometimes re-edited and polished when it's collected and published over the centuries. And we know that's true for Milarepa's own poetry. So that's one aspect of the story. The other aspect is that uh, although Milarepa um, was presenting a new form of poetry, a deeply Tibetan form, it's drawing on, the, uh, on, on uh, very important Indian antecedents. And these were uh, several forms. Most pr prominently, uh, the form of poetry called the Doha, which is a kind of couplet originally recorded in, up, in Upper Brahmsha. And these were the poems of the great siddhas, the Mahasiddhas, the great meditative yogis of ancient India, um, who were not by and large, were not monks, didn't live in monasteries, but they lived much like Milarepa did in the, in the mountains, sort of countryside, on the margins of society, spending their time in, in meditation, especially the esoteric Buddhist practices of, of Tantra. And they wrote these very beautiful couplets that were illustrations of their own inner awakening. They're very self-reflective, they're very experiential, and the Tibetan form of gore is very different aesthetically, literarily, than Doha. But in terms of content, in terms of their mode of expression, there's a direct connection. Gore is very experiential. It's very much self-referential of one's own religious practice. But what's so wonderful, if you're interested in Tibetan literature, as I am, and as I know you are, Puchunla, um, is that Milarepa's poetry is deeply reflective of Tibet's unique culture, uh, it, it, its unique culture. It uses specific linguistic elements, but also refers to the specific environments of the Tibetan plateau. He writes a lot about the high mountains, the snow-covered mountains, and even the jungles of the lowland Himalayan regions. He's very much an author of his own environment. Much of his poetry is deeply, is rich in its environmental evocation. It's one of the things that I appreciate most about them. So thank you for that question. We have a question here from the center. I'm Hoinu Hauser, a journalist from Manipur and a seeker. I just wanted to ask both of you, perhaps, should atonement, reconciliation, forgiveness, should necessarily be the result of somebody's, uh, I wouldn't say it crime, but misdeed, 
or if those things weren't there, do you think the level or the depth of his search would not be deep enough? For instance, in the case of Milarepa, if he had not gone through all the uh, trials and tribulations yeah. and uh, revenge, should we be even discussing him? Do you think the depth of what he searched would not have been deep enough? Wonderful question. Do you want to say something? You know, I cannot speak as intelligently as Andrew on the subject of Milarepa or Buddhism, for that matter, Andrew. I acknowledge that. But I do have my own philosophy on the matter. I think enlightenment is gained through access. So when I say access, it doesn't mean access suffering or access experience of a negative kind. Enlightenment can be through an excess of too much joy also. So these days we have this very simple philosophy that uh, coffee karma. You drink too much coffee, you're going to be too charged. <laughs> you're going to have food karma or food coma. And so it's a fine example of you don't necessarily have to go through suffering in order to s seek out atonement or you could go through excess joy also and then tone it back and seek to balance your life out, which eventually results in possibly Buddha's idea of the middle path, moderation. That's my philosophy. I hope that Thank helps. you. That's, a, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Time, time for a, a, a few very short questions. Yes, a very short question, if I may. Uh, there's another figure in Buddhist lore, particularly in Bhutan, is Jukpa Kinle. Uh, are there any similarities or, uh, or do they belong to completely different dimensions? Yeah. I feel like I should let you answer that as the, as the Bhutanese representative. No, no, no. Uh, I think this one is for Andrew, but I'll very quickly just say that Jukpa Kinle and Milarepa, though uh, they can be confused on the face of it, are quite different. In fact, I must be completely honest, I horrified Andrew <laughs> when I reached out to him with a preset of questions saying that, oh, I'm going to ask you how Milarepa was such a maverick for his time. And Andrew wrote back very coldly, you know, and, and I, I, I mended my ways, I atoned for my sins, and I reached my enlightenment all in one email. Thank you, Andrew. And now I hand it over to you. They are totally different. Yeah, thank you for that question. Drupa Kunlig uh, is, is also a rich and, and wonderful uh, uh, character in Buddhist history in Bhutan. The literature of his life and his songs are also are, are equally uh, wonderful. And they're similar in, in, in several ways. They, they embody the spirit of, of deep Buddhist practice. They embody a spirit of, of not... A, not adhering necessarily to conventional ideas about what Buddhist practice looks like, but the way that Milarepa belongs to the entire Himalayan world, Jupa Kunlek really belongs to Bhutan. He is really a hero of the Bhutanese people, and he should be understood that way. If possible, I'd, I'd like to call on Jules uh, if you have a question, maybe our last question here. Hi, Andrew. Nice to see you. Um, a little hesitant to ask, but you touched on it, and so I will. You mentioned the journey from Milarepa's spontaneous exposition to, you know, what we end up with. And I just wonder, you know, you spent so much time pouring through these things. What's your sense of how much the Milarepa who's come to us is the Milarepa of those Himalayan caves, and how much is Tsang Yun Hiroka's work on the, what he received centuries later? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. It's really the historian's dilemma in working on a literary history like this. I know we're out of time, so I'll make this very short. There are two ways that, that we could answer this. One is that looking at the history of Milarepa's life and the way it was represented in literature is a little bit like peeling an onion. You peel layer after layer after layer, you're getting closer and closer to the heart of it, and then suddenly you realize, poof, there's nothing there. And you can't do anything but that. 
And in the end, really what that points us to is that Milarepa is the figure that we know through literature. There is no distinction. That to ask who is Milarepa, the historical figure, is the wrong question to ask. What we can ask is who is Milarepa embodied by the stories of his life and the way that those stories have been read and transmitted and are recreated in ritual practice, in ritual dance like they do in Bhutan, in artwork, in meditation practice, in devotional practice to one's guru. Those are the ways in which Milarepa is really alive and has always been alive and continues to remain alive uh, in the world today. We thank you all for your questions. Just to wind it down before I hand it back to the end word, uh, Andrew was looking a little pale to me, so I bought him some nettle tea. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and a little story my grand aunt gave me about Millerepa oh, and the pigeons. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So I hope you enjoy that. And we'd like to thank you all for participating. I hope we have piqued enough interest in you for you to go out and get yourself a copy of this lovely book, uh, Mystics and Skeptics in Search of Himalayan Masters. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>